I'm Traveling John, and I'm going to travel and sketch. Join me on the adventure. In the last episode, we traveled from Auburn to the San Francisco Bay Area. We crossed over the Golden Gate Bridge and looked back at it from the Pacific Ocean coastline. Today we visit another famous landmark along the side of the Presidio called the Palace of Fine Art. Welcome back to Travel and Sketch. Today we're going to be visiting a very beautiful building called the Palace of Fine Arts. It is a part of a huge exposition that took place over a hundred years ago in San Francisco and it's the only remaining building of what was called the Panama Pacific International Exposition. And this exposition was put on as a celebration for the completion of the Panama Canal. And uh, that was a very important uh, change in the uh, for the Pacific Coast and business because now ships that were traveling from the East Coast to San Francisco didn't have to go all the way around uh, South America but could take a shortcut right through the Panama Canal and likewise ships uh, taking uh, timber or whatever to the East Coast could uh, take a shortcut uh, through the Panama Canal too. So it was a saving of a great deal of money and time <clears throat> in that era. And what I've done is I've gotten an old video that, ex that sort of shows you what the Panama Pacific International Expo Exposition included. It included a lot of exhibits. It was very similar to the World's Fair that we uh, may have today. And um, so, Enjoy this old video. It's a little rough, so I hope that doesn't bother you too much. Uh, but enjoy it, and after the video, I'll be right back at the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco to continue uh, this travel and sketch. <laughs> In its magically beautiful setting by the Golden Gate, the Palace of Fine Arts, the last surviving memory of the Phantom City, still proudly stands in stately grandeur and where Palace of Fairyland have been replaced by countless homes. Turning back the pages of time, we find President William Howard Taft breaking ground on February the 25th, 1911, for the Phantom City. And then after an army of architects, artists, and engineers had dreamed their best dreams and had brought them to life, it was ready. Magnificent courts and fountains, its walls of creamy travertine, its ever-blooming gardens stretching along the shores of the Golden Gate. At a signal from President Wilson, the fountain of energy burst into activity. The gates were thrown open and the world had its first glimpse of a phantom city. What a sight and what a crowd, all eager to explore its mysteries and marvel at its splendor. Mayor James Ralph Jr. dedicated the Phantom City. Charles Seymour, its president, spoke in response. Secretary Franklin K. Lane represented President Wilson and Governor Hiram Johnson spoke for California. It was a great day and a great crowd the Tower of Jewels, beautiful beyond description, sparkling with hundreds of thousands of multicolored jewels in the brilliant sun or in the night illumination, it was the central and dominant feature of the Phantom City. 
in the center of the lovely South Gardens, the fountain of energy, flanked on either side by twin mermaid pools, greeted the eye of the visitor. And to the left was the Crystal Dome Palace Horticulture, Byzantine in architecture, suggesting the Mosque of Ahmed the I in Constantinople, housing within strange and beautiful plants from all the tropical world. To the right, Festival Hall, a shrine where music lovers worshipped and where world-famous notables spoke to huge gatherings. And just back of the tower was the court of the universe, with the two famous statues, the rising sun and the setting sun. Now the court of abundance embraced the beautiful fountain of the earth. The fountain series graced the symbolic court of four seasons. The Court of Palms, with a sunken pool containing that beloved statue, the end of the trail. Majestic colonnades surrounded the Court of Flowers and the Beauty and Beast Fountain. The Fine Arts Palace, with its priceless art treasures in its exquisite setting by the lagoon, will live in memory forever. Sculptors from all over the world brought their skill to adorn the Phantom City. Every school of art was represented. Palaces and courts and fountains all carried their quarter of sculptural beauty. These few statues are but a reminder of the countless others just as lovely. And the distances were magnificent. Now here's a glimpse down the avenue of palms, a vision of breathtaking beauty. Machinery Hall Avenue lit past the largest wooden building ever constructed and where was staged the only indoor flight in aviation history. There's only a time for a glimpse of the many state and foreign buildings, picturesque and individual, and housing rare exhibits from the far corners of the earth. Remember the little auto trains rushing busily about? The electric chairs, they're not dangerous, but uh, stubborn. And the one-man push chairs? Well, pedestrians, though, were in the majority. And the four million square feet of pavement echoed to the beat of tired feet. Never was a more welcome guest than the Liberty Bell, carried all the way from Philadelphia in a flower deck car, symbolizing the spirit of American freedom. The magic of his own invention brings back the Thomas Edison of a bygone day with his pal, Henry Ford, in a happy, carefree moment. Uh -uh. And just look at this automobile race. Here they come with all two cylinders roaring. Hey, hey, hey. Look out there. <laughs> yeah, not even four-wheel brakes would slow up these speed demons. Styles have changed since 1915, haven't they? And look at this Merry Widow Waltz, or uh, uh, is it the Grizzly Bear? Ah, no, no, don't laugh. You dance that way too. <laughs> you know, look, it was on the playground of the Phantom City, a mile of gaiety. And uh, do you remember Stella, the submarines, the aeroscope? <laughs> you know, here all the nations of the earth came to play. The Indians shook their eagle feathers, the Samoans and the Maoris danced their ritual rhythms to tom-toms beating, and the Mexicans danced to the soft guitar. You know, I wonder where these little maypole dancers are today. Rid of all the concessions with the five-acre miniature of the Panama Canal with real water, the locks and lakes and ships all performing for the delighted spectators who viewed the spectacle from a traveling train. Uh, here are the Daffodil Girls, all dolled up to visit the Phantom City. You know, many organizations long forgotten 
paraded gaily through these grounds. That day, a boy in his teens, Art Lindbergh never had a heartier reception. Assembling his suicide plane, fashioned from bamboo, the motor perched just behind the aviator's head, looks strangely unfamiliar in this day of 20 passenger cabin planes. But remember, Art Smith was a pioneer. Mr. Lincoln Beachy, aviation martyr of the Phantom City. Peter Rossi, another pioneer, was willing to take long chances with such a flimsy set of wings, flapping wires and bicycle wheels, but he did almost anything in the air that modern flyers can do. Art Aviators were daredevils in 1915, and the crowd loved them. A hero myth on this perilous perch is getting ready for the first illuminated night flight in aviation history. Over the brilliant lights of the Phantom City, he soared and dived and looped, with strings of fire behind him like twin comets blazing across the uncharted skyways. Then, swooping to earth, the wings of his plane, a mass of flames, a uh, never-to-be-forgotten thrill. And do you remember the Phantom City at night? All the beauty in the world seemed concentrated there. Buildings were bathed in a soft radiance of colored light, while the fountains glistened with a myriad of color. Great rainbows were cast on clouds of steam, and there were no real clouds to reflect the light. And then, in December 1915, the last lights of the Phantom City flickered out, its fountains forever silenced. We stood with tear-dimmed eyes, feeling that it was not the end, but only a beginning. We're at the Palace of Fine Arts here in San Francisco, not far from the Presidio. It's only a 15-minute walk. And here is a gorgeous piece of architecture that was a part of the World's Fair right after the San Francisco earthquake a long time ago. But it's a beautiful place to walk around, lake. I'm going to do a sketch of that building there, and I hope you enjoy it. This is a third vlog that I'm making and uh, I want to go through the process of doing my ink line sketch with you real quickly. I've done it before, but uh, for those of you that are new, this is what I do. Um, first of all, I did a, uh, a photograph reference uh, when I was at the Palace of Fine Art in San Francisco, and from the photo reference, I did this real rough ink line sketch so I could put everything in the position that I want it on my finished canvas and of course it's a lot smaller and then I even reduced it down smaller to this small illustration that's only about five inches wide. From that I put it on this art projector on the bottom and attached it to it and projected that inkline sketch to the canvas in pencil, light pencil, just as reference so I could use it to help me as a guide when I do the inkline sketch. So now I'm going to go into the process of doing the inkline sketch. As I uh, begin this sketch of the Palace of Fine Arts, I would like to read something I got off the internet at the website for the palaceoffinearts.org. There is a section there on history and um, this is what uh, they wrote. In 1915, when the Panama Pacific International Exposition opened, it was a time of turmoil for the world and for the city of San Francisco. The city was just recovering from the terrible earthquake and fire of 1906. The nations of the Europe were engaged in economic and political troubles that would lead to the start of World War I. The civic leaders of San Francisco envisioned a bold plan 
to bring the world together to encourage trade and to show the future of the world as it could be and to demonstrate that a rebuilt San Francisco would be truly an international city. Well, I'm trying to uh, do a lot of the detail here in the dome. It's amazing the beautiful work that was done on this. You uh, really can't appreciate it until you get real close. These are the capitals of the columns that go around. Each one is like a Corinthian style. I'm having to move the canvas in all different directions just to uh, get my hand in the right position to do the line work. One of the uh, real fun parts of this trip to the Palace of Fine Art was to not only walk around the grounds because it's a beautiful park, but also to walk around and actually go right underneath the large dome. So I'm going to include a little video I took here of that experience, just so you will appreciate the size. It's huge. They have these big ornate vases that sit on either side of the columns all the way around the dome. You get a little bit of feeling of how huge this place is. I'm putting in a strong black now for the shading. shrubs there. A vase in the background, black in the shade or the shadow. The thick walls of the dome. It's amazing to think at one point that this dome was, half of it was collapsed and uh, they redid it to bring it up to where it is today. It's so good that they restored it. The trees are beautiful around the palace. Makes it look like a Garden of Eden. There's another part of that um, write-up that was on the Pacific of FineArts.org website in the history section that I'd like to read you at this point because it applies to what I'm going to be drawing in just a second. Bernard R. Maybeck was chosen as architect for the Palace of Fine Arts. The inspiration for the palace with its soaring colonnade, grand rotunda, and carefully constructed pond was meant to evoke quiet sadness and solemnity. This is most evident as one observes the weeping ladies facing into the tops of the columns throughout the park. Maybeck's choice of inspiration from classical painters was interesting, given that the purpose of the Palace of Fine Arts was to showcase artists at a period of time when modern art was beginning to emerge. Again, I'm using the straight edge to get some nice straight pillars and putting in some foliage as there was 
between the pillars to help those stand out. Behind those pillars, or the colonnade, is a large auditorium, um, part of which today is used as a theater. Originally, that large structure in the back was used as the exhibit hall for all the beautiful art. Now I'm doing the reflection pool using just lines to capture the reflection of the buildings and the colonnade. Just a soft point of interest in the foreground. Two seagulls. I really like the way that shadow turned up in the arch and the dome. So I want to really make that stand out, make it a little darker. Little touch up on shadows. And that's, and that's complete. So here is the finished piece of artwork, inkline sketch of the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco. And uh, I just want to point out a few things that might be hard to see there, um, but I put two little seagulls in the water here. Uh, in the pond area. And the reason I did that is because I wanted something there. I just didn't want reflections of the Palace of Fine Art, but I wanted something else of interest. But I didn't want it to pop so... I didn't want to put so much definition in or so that it would pop out and become uh, a, a, a focal point. I just wanted it to be rough and loose and sketchy so that one would get the feeling or one, could, one would, might draw their eye down to it and back up to the Palace of Fine Art and sort of draw one's attention back and forth around that, this. I did put a lot of detail into the water, but the reason for that, of course, was to bring uh, in the reflection, which is so beautiful in the F Palace of Fine Art in that pond area. So the next step is going to be to bring color into the sketch. And once again, I'm not going to add color directly onto this inkline sketch. This is a finished piece of artwork as it stands. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, do a scan of this artwork. And then uh, in that, on the computer itself, after doing some watercolors, I'm going to apply that watercolor to in the computer to the inkline sketch and you'll see me once again go through that process. So I can get a color version of this beautiful piece of architecture in San Francisco. So I'm starting off with the watercolor on, uh, is stretched on a board and I put the uh, overhead transparency in reverse on the back of the board. Of course the board has a hole in it so I can see um, the transparency and through it just taping it to push the um, acetate and the transparency against the watercolor board. I'm going to turn it over so now it's face up and you can see it through there with the light table. Unfortunately I didn't do the incline dark enough. I wish I had done it darker. Next time I will. I can manipulate that again in the process so it's not so light but still it's workable so I'm spraying it with some water and now I'm gonna start putting some color on I did this three times to get what I was hoping to get so in other words I had the stretched watercolor paper on three different boards 
And actually, this is a video of the one I decided to use. Getting a variety of colors in there. And I'll move the board as you see. I put a little green at the bottom because I wanted a little more green in the pool of water. in there and that's where the building is I sprayed it with water again now I'm gonna move it around get some interesting effects play a little bit more with the brush mix the colors up may not see this but I sprinkled it a little bit with salt just to affect the watercolor you can see a little bit of the effects is a little white well I finished the watercolors and I'm going to show all three of them to you and uh, let you know which one I decided upon once again when I'm doing these uh, watercolors I want them to be very flowing and free and so some of these um, may look uh, a little bit too flowing and too free but anyway um, this is the first one I did and uh, interesting but it just doesn't work with the illustration uh, this one is another one I did and as you can see there's some little speckles in it that was done with salt uh, that I put on the watercolor as it what before it was drying excuse me as it was drying and it, it has some very interesting effects to it. I wanted some special effects to this because I wanted it to look a little sort of fantasy uh, in a sense because I think the uh, Palace of Fine Arts sort of has that feeling about it, very classic but a little bit of a fantasy and in it. Uh, so this is the one I decided upon and uh, it's strong in color and in some uh, areas I'm going to uh, mellow that down a little bit. Uh, I'm going to place the ink line sketch over it uh, just so you can get some idea of how I'm going to position things. Um, now, this ink line sketch on this overhead transparency is a little light, uh, and I wish I had made it darker. Um, next time, I hope I, I hope I will. But basically, you can get sort of a concept as to where this is going. Uh, the Palace of Fine Art, the main building is going to be right in this strong area. The water here and some of the pillars uh, in that area with the sky. So the next thing I'm going to do again is scan this watercolor and apply it to the ink line sketch on the computer. So that's the next step and uh, we'll proceed to that. So this is the finished illustration of the Palace of Fine Art ink line drawing on my computer and um, I'm going to show you the color uh, there's a the color after I've scanned it and put it um, as a layer in the Photoshop okay so what I'm going to do is work with a colonnade right in there with all the pillars and start putting color in there because the color in there at the Palace of Fine Arts was sort of a uh, very light yellowish brown color. So I'm gonna start a new layer and I'm gonna, I've already made a path for the colonnade and I'm gonna select that and use one pixel. Okay, I'm gonna fill that with some color. Okay, there we go. Now, that's too strong. And so on that layer, I'm going to change, I'm gonna change it instead of a solid color. There we go, color, okay. Deselect it. I'm gonna take, it's a little bit strong, so I'm gonna take it down just a little bit, like there. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the large building uh, of the Palace of Fine Arts. So I'm going to find that path and uh, make selection. OK, 
Okay, so you may be able to see like the little white dot, dotted line vibrating. That's the area I'm going to fill. Yeah, I'm going to fill that in with the color. Okay. Okay, again, that's a solid color. And it's a little bit strong. So I'm going to go down again for that layer. Instead of normal color, I'm going to make it color. Okay, there we go. And I'm going to lighten it up a little bit because, again, it's a little bit strong. Okay. Wow, that gives it a real antique look. Next thing I'm going to do is I work with the dome up above. Go to my pass and make a selection of that. Start a new layer. And in this case, in this case, I, no, I take this back down again. I am just going to give it a little bit of white. And I'm going to get out my paintbrush tool, make it a good size. Okay, I'm just going to give it a little bit of white. Okay, there we go. Now, you know, um, one thing that's frustrating me a little bit is I, I think the, the area around on the sky is a little bit too grayish for me. So I, I want to either lighten that up or give it a little bit of color. So I'm going to go down to the watercolor and I'm going to choose a blue to lighten it up. That's a little bit too turquoise, somewhere in there. And in this case, instead of airbrushing it with normal, I'm going to airbrush it with color again. And so I don't have to see all those lines. I'm going to uh, view, show. I'm not going to show this lock to the edge so I can think about what I'm doing. Okay, again, I'm just working on that color. There we go, that's better. And a little bit over here, more blue over here. There we go. There, okay, that's better. That's much better. The large building. The pillars are a little bit more reddish in color. They're not so yellow. So I'm gonna select those. There we go. And I'm going to choose a color more in liking with the actual building. They're a little bit, a little bit more red. Sort of in there. Now I'm going to start another path for that area. And I'm just going to put those in lightly. doing a 50% color just so I don't get too much at one time. Now, some of those are reflected in the water below. I've already selected those tools to those areas, so it's not too much. Ah, I don't want to do that. It's too much. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the main building again, the large building. And this area is just a little bit intense for me. So I'm going to somehow lighten that area up. I know what I need to do. I need to go back to the watercolor and make that lighter. Okay, so now I'm working in the watercolor area level. And I'm going to make that a, a bit brighter. Okay, so I'm not working in the color. I'm working in the watercolor behind it. That may be hard to understand, but anyway, so be it. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to select the water. There is some issues here that I want to try to resolve. One is the intensity is a little bit much. So let me see. Go back to layers. Go to the watercolor area. Okay. 
Gonna go to hue and saturation. Should I go light? Uh, it's not bad. That's more in keeping to what I want. Should I take that on the saturation? Just a little bit. I think that's better. Okay, so there's one duck here. Uh, I did the uh, selected area around the duck so I could lighten that up a little bit. So again, I'm going down to the watercolor <clears throat> and I'm going to take out some of that color here. That's so why I'm going to erase some of the color in that because I think it looked a little bit sickly being green. Okay, so the next thing I would like to try to do <clears throat> and you, as you can see the colonnades come I mean the columns come down in that colonnade here I'm gonna select that and I'm gonna make another layer okay here we go okay just a little bit of reflection of that I want to choose that area and I'm going I'm going to also choose this area. What I'm trying to do is get some of the yellow reflection of the building down into the water. And I'm going to choose this area. Well, actually, it's a little bit far over. So I'm going to choose this area. Okay. So let's see what this does. Again, I'm at the same layer as a colonnade reflection. There we go. Okay, just a little feeling of the color. I finished the color illustration of the Palace of Fine Arts and I did a little bit more work on it after the video touching up I like to come back to it about a day later maybe even two and look at it and see how I might improve it this is a print up uh, the finished full color Palace of Fine Arts and um, you uh, you may notice that there's an extra two inches going around it. Of course, that makes it more suitable for framing. I did the same with the black and white illustration. There's an extra two inches around that. If you're interested in purchasing either a print of the black and white or the color, I have limited editions on printed on very fine archival watercolor paper available at etsy.com there you'll find the original black and white sketch that I did on canvas and that you might be interested in there's only one of those as you might understand and um, I just want to thank you so much for joining me on this travel and sketch adventure of course I'll be doing some more and if you would like some information about me, please go to travelandsketch.com. And please come back and join me for the next adventure in Travel and Sketch.